each of these uh, cards has enabled a particular unique play pattern to occur. <gasps> Destruction makers. We got into thinking about what creates unique play patterns. How do you get decks that feel very different from each other? Right. And one one of the things that they do, uh, you know, that Mark Rosewater has talked about uh, is that they create sort of these signpost uncommons for draft archetypes. Yeah. And a lot of times these serve as sort of enablers, as we're as we're calling them, uh, that create a particular type of play pattern. There used, used to be a little more parasitic in design. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, you know sort of how we're defining a card that is an uh, is an enabler is a card that uh, sort of en- enables a play pattern and enables a deck to exist. Before we start talking about enablers and Magic the Gathering, if you like the channel, please give us a little like and subscribe and maybe a comment. Back to the video. Right. So maybe let, let's just probably touch on examples first. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um take us away <laughs> <laughs> okay so so a uh, couple examples here uh there's a card called greater good which causes a four mana uh, enchantment that allows you to sacrifice a creature to draw cards equal to its power and then discard three cards uh i'm just going to ramble off a few examples real quick and then yeah. we'll go back and talk about why we're we're saying these are enablers uh another one is sensei's divining top uh, this card uh, lets you pay one mana to look at the top three cards of your library to, and then you can rearrange them in any order. Uh, or you can tap Sensei's Divining Top to draw the top card of your, your deck and then put Sensei's Divining Top on top of your deck. Uh, and then the third one that we're going to be talking about is Astral Slide. And Astral Slide is an enchantment that costs three mana that whenever you cycle a card, you can remove a creature from the game and then return it to the battlefield at the end of your, at the end of the turn. Right. Um, and so I think that each of these are kind of enablers in a little bit of a different way, um, but they th- each of these uh, cards has enabled a particular unique play pattern to occur um, in, in a tournament uh, level deck, basically. Right. I think the reason that we were kind of, as we were talking about it, realizing why these cards feel so cool is that there's there's sort of four categories of cards. There's probably more. We're going to have other videos following up on this, but uh, the, the uh, initial ones that we were kind of discussing were enablers, enhancers, uh, interaction, and payoffs. Uh, so the reason that enablers really stuck out uh, to us is because initially um, they might seem kind of like do-nothings, yeah. But the reason that we think that they're so cool is because they end up changing the system in a meaningful way. Right. Um, and so they end up allowing new points of interaction that based off of the uh, general uh, initial rules of the game, you're not allowed or not able to interact with things in that way. So greater good allows creatures to be sacrificed, which is not normally something you'd be able to do with any given creature. Yeah, it sort of like changes the fundamental rules of the game for you specifically and not for your opponent. Right. And this is more than just something like, oh, whenever you play a creature, you draw a card. That's more of like an enhancer because you could have things that end up, you know, you get some sort of a payoff or another enabler that does something for drawing cards. But like, it's just a general sort of resource generation. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is an additional point of interaction. Um, like that can uh, exponentially grow in different ways, right? Like you could want to sacrifice a creature because you have graveyard interaction because you want that creature to have some effect when it dies. Like there's all sorts of different things that can stem from that. Right, right. Uh, yeah, in the case of Greater Good, um, it was particularly interesting, the deck that it, that uh, it ended up being enabled because of greater good i guess uh it was a uh, kind of a, a unique green stompy deck uh which i don't it's my favorite i don't remember if it had a particular name that was it i think well no there's a the green stompy is like an archetype great um, i didn't know that <laughs> oh whoops uh so so the big card that was being played alongside greater good at this moment in standard was a card called groundbreaker which is uh, a plane uh plane it was in planar chaos so like it used to be ball lightning i think from which was a red card but groundbreaker in green was now three green mana for a six one trample haste that at the end of your turn you had to sacrifice groundbreaker so greater good enables you to instead of sacrificing it to its own ability to a sac- to sacrifice it to greater good to draw six cards and then discard three cards which is right. particularly good for green especially at the time right. um there's a few other cards too there was like a horse card that had haste that was also in the deck any rate 
deck was really cool. Uh, you basically got to attack and then draw a bunch of cards and attack again and eventually kill your opponent. Right. Um, but yeah, so so that is sort of the baseline example of what an enabler might might do uh, in terms of creating a, a unique play pattern. Yeah. Um, when we look at Sensei's Divining Top, uh, Sensei's Divining Top enabled this deck called Miracles, which was one of the best decks in Legacies for uh, in Legacy for a long time. Uh, until I think Sensei's Divining Top got banned. I'm pretty sure it's banned in almost every format. Yeah. Mostly due to the fact that. It makes, it's just annoying. It's just annoying. It, <laughs> Literally, it, that's the only reason. Right. It's it makes just, games take too long. Yeah. Um, what's funny is like people that were really good at playing the Miracles deck, it didn't take too long, but it was probably just too good, I guess. I don't know. Miracles was a great deck. Uh, but basically, Sensei's Divining Top enabled you to stack the top of your deck, uh, and manipulate it, save Miracles for the particular moment, because you could sort of like reorganize the top cards of your deck and, and move them further down if you wanted to like draw cards and things, mm -hmm. but then also move them to the top. Uh, and then draw them with Sensei's Divining Top to, to use, get the Miracle whenever you wanted to at instant speed. Right. Um, Great so, flavor, by the way. Just oh, really fantastic. Sure. <laughs> Honestly, that whole combination, it's using funny. this Divining Top into yeah. playing Miracle, I just love it. Right. I mean, there's really like a flavor payoff there too, right? Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I think it's neat. It is neat. It's a cool deck. Anyway, enablers. <laughs> So, uh, really the big one, and, and part of the reason why we wanted to make this video is the card Astral Slide. Your card. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite cards ever made. Uh, the thing that is really interesting in terms of Astral Slide being an enabler is that it is connecting the dots between two disparate effects, right? So, uh, it basically, for you, you're changing the rules of the game for yourself, and that whenever you cycle a card, you get to flicker effectively a creature old school flicker meaning you remove it from the game and then it comes back at the end of turn rather mm -hmm. than immediately um it's connecting the dots between cycling a card and then creatures that have entered the battlefield effects right and so you end up creating this really interesting play experience through uh, a mechanic that can be used at instant speed cycling uh with removing your creatures or your opponent's creatures from the game and then getting value based on that interaction. And it turns out uh, Astral Slide is pretty unique. Uh, we right. tried, we looked through probably a few hundred cards uh, before recording this video because we were trying to find other examples. And Astral Slide might just be like one of the strongest enablers yeah, based off of kind of what we're going off of for our yeah, definition. There's another one that's kind of similar called uh, Crystal Shard, which uh, actually created sort of a deck archetype right after Astral Slide, sort of in Astral Slide's image, hmm. where Crystal Shard is an artifact that you can tap to return a creature to its owner's hands unless they pay one mana. And you would basically just bounce your own creatures back to your hand and then replay them. Not, okay. not nearly as powerful as Astral Slide. Right. <laughs> I think what makes Astral Slide so unique is that there's so many points of interaction that you get out of it where greater good is like yeah your creatures can now sacrifice themselves there's some shenanigans that you can do with that uh probably mm -hmm. more so in any sort of like an eternal format but astral slide is it changes how cycling works so um technically you can have some payoff of like discard and whatever but that's just how cycling works anyway but then you can target your creatures and you can target your opponent's creatures um and so I think those two points just make it that much stronger, whereas most right. of these enablers are enabling your plan for you to do your thing, not also acting as a disruption for your opponent. Right. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a really, really big point of interaction for it as being one of the, I think, probably the best enablers of all time. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's pretty interesting about like the the sort of deck archetype that it spawned was that it, it has a really interesting interaction with morph creatures. Mm. So morph being one of the premier me premier mechanics at the time that Astral Slide was created, mm. uh, you know, onslaught block. Um, so you you could morph a creature face down, and then you could f uh, flicker it, old old flicker, uh, with with Astral Slide, and it would come back in face up. So uh, okay. you, you end up not having to pay the morph cost of the creature, right? Yeah. And so the the card that it was played with at the time was um, Exalted Angel. Uh, Exalted Angel has morph. You'd put it to play face down. You'd fl flicker it, turn it face up, and then it'd be back to your turn. You could attack with it, gain life. Uh, very good. Very good interactions. Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we were kind of like, I was really racking my brain in terms of like, okay, what are the other like really clear 
enablers uh, that are sort of on the same level as Astral Slide over the years that I have played with, and I really couldn't come up with any that are as, I guess, unique as Astral Slide. So anybody yeah. in the comments, if you can think of some that are yes, similar to Astral Slide in terms of... Uh, you know, uh, additional vectors of interaction that it enables by you playing that card, uh, please, in the comments, let us know. Yeah, but Astral Slide definitely seems to be unique in its ability to, yeah, uh, change how you interact with the things on your field as well as disrupting your opponent. It just seems like such a strong... Uh, 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 branching of interaction point. These are a, a bit unique to Magic in a way, in that I think without a persistent board state, um, these types of cards that sort of modify the rules of the game and change it sort of for, for you in particular um, wouldn't be able to stick around long enough for you to sort of build these play patterns around, uh, you know, with them mostly being probably, you know, enchantments and artifacts, uh, things that sort of like, are, are more permanent, let's say, than creatures, right? They're, they're sort of here to stay so you can build your strategy around them. Uh, where in other games that don't have nearly as persistent of a board state, I don't think we see a lot of enablers in this way. Yeah, I think uh, people, I think, take for granted the fact that trading card games uh, in particular have these persistent board states that like, I think more games nowadays have it, but it wasn't super common, I feel like, prior to that. The idea of the sort of evolving game state that grows over time, I don't think was like super common prior to trading card games in existence. Maybe they they were, but I remember looking into this as I was working on like deck building games because deck building games don't really have a great like persistent board state a lot right. of the time. Um, and I couldn't find a whole lot of examples um, yeah. prior to, yeah, around the development of trading card games. But um, I think what is really interesting is that I think a lot of trading card games miss this part of enablers. Right. Um, I mean, they must if, like, there's barely any that we could find in Magic's case, even. Yeah. Like, there's very few, especially on the level of Astral Slide. That, like, the majority of these sort of, like, persistent board state attachments that adjust the rules in the player's favor, yeah. uh, making it asymmetrical, is almost always enhancers, where it's, mm -hmm. okay, you can play a spell. Whenever you cast a red spell, you deal a damage, right? right. Whenever you play a blue spell, you draw an extra card, something like that. Um, and that's just essentially enhancing, right? It's not allowing a whole other vector of interaction that wasn't previously available to you. Um, I think if we're going to look at like, okay, well, what are the, like the, the pitfalls of this sort of design idea uh, and what, what might make it so that the, these cards don't end up as successful as say something like Astro Slide? Right. I think um, when we talk about mechanics for games that, we work on um we tend to categorize uh mechanics into three categories uh where basically every mechanic in this case magic cards and their effects uh are usually slotted into sort of three things which is uh you're trying to win the game now you're trying to win the game later uh a, a, a greater uh, later i guess like trying to get a better advantage for later on yeah. or uh you're trying to stop your opponent from winning um those are the three categories uh, the problem is that enablers, they slot into the, you're trying to win the game later, right? Technically, as you play Astral Slide, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have its own ETB. Uh, this kind of moves away from like how Magic designs cards now, where we see this in like the most recent, I think, uh, thing I can think of, card type is battles. Mm -hmm. um, even like, uh, I think class cards maybe started doing this too. A lot of these cards that are like enchantments or something usually have some sort of an ETB. Uh, yeah. as they come onto the battlefield because they want to make sure that you at least get instantaneous value yeah. before it ends up getting removed, which is like a feel good thing. I understand. I think that's totally fine. I don't have anything against it, but I do think that uh, you investing in something like Astral Slide or like these enablers is sort of investing into the possibility that you can actually uh, do much better later on in the game. Right, and really in the case of Astral Slide, you are creating sort of this like engine that your deck sort of functions around. And I think that's a risky strategy in general, right? It's that you're like, okay, well, if I don't have Astral Slide, your deck still works, right? You still have good creatures that enter the battlefield. You still have cards that cycle that can draw you into another Astral Slide. And I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why Astral Slide in particular uh, was, was successful in terms of being an enabler. But... Other ones maybe aren't tied as closely to mechanics that sort of can uh, help you get to the thing itself, right? 
uh, dredge might be one that sort of comes up as a mechanic that might be tied into. I think you know my my Sadisi commander deck kind of enters this mm. astral slide area in that like, okay, well if, if I'm trying to get to Snarling Gorehound, which is kind of a piece of a soft combo. Yeah. I'm using Dredge to get closer to those cards to get into play with Sidisi and like end up making a bunch of zombies. But like it doesn't it 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 doesn't quite hit the same the same way that Astral Slide does. What what's particularly interesting with uh Astral Slide as an enabler, like you said, it doesn't really do anything on its own. It's kind of you know, it, it, oftentimes you call these do nothings. Yeah. Um but it does. It is a an investment in your economy strategy in terms of the amount of value you're going to be getting off of any card that you play now that is related to Astral Slide. Yeah. But it of itself doesn't. It's not even connecting the dots specifically to economy in that. You know, economy usually is I'm drawing cards. I'm getting extra lands. I'm getting further ahead of my opponent. Astral Slide when you play it doesn't do anything like that. Yeah. It just says, well, now that if you're playing these other cards, you're going to get additional value from them. Yeah. I feel like I, now it probably should have done maybe a little more research prior to this. So I'm kind of going off the cuff a little bit. But I feel like when I'm seeing newer trading card games developed, I'm not seeing these type of cards made as often. And I yeah. kind of wonder if part of it is that it kind of slows the pacing down. You're not moving the game forward by doing this. That's true. Um, yeah. And like if I'm thinking about like my time playing like the Digimon trading card game, for instance, I feel like there was a lot of this instantaneous value. And they didn't really, I guess they kind of had cards that would be like the trainer cards or tamer cards or whatever that acted as basically artifacts or enchantments um, that sort of gave you this thing in the future. But it was never really a point of interaction as much as it was just sort of benefiting a very specific already existing archetype, mm. right? I love that Astral Side sort of um we, we've talked about this i think but i think we should probably do a whole video on this that like i love cards that sort of like dare the player to do something with it yeah where it's like all right this card literally only does things if you have cycling cards what can you do with it um and right. like it's a neat challenge it ended up being like a really good challenge <laughs> right <laughs> but uh i i think that those are really interesting especially when they change how you end up playing the game yeah, and it, and you know, it, Astral Slide in its case in particular, it's not uh, shoring up weaknesses the way that Greater Good is. It's it is just additional value on top of mechanics that were already good. Yeah, and I think that's definitely something that makes it unique. So, in terms of like what we think, you know, game designers or, or can take away from this, uh, I do think that uh, a persistent board state really helps in terms of how you can create these types of cards that can enable new types of play patterns. Uh, and I do think that looking for uh, ways to connect disparate interactions is a really good way, like like Astral Slide does, is a really good way to create uh, additional value and make it so that these enablers are worth playing because they, they don't necessarily win you the game right away. Right. I do think that it's it's tough because I think that we probably uh, were more likely to see uh, cards like Astral Slide um, in when magic was doing more parasitic designs um sure where they could get away with okay you can have this specific mechanic go and trigger in this unique way um because they knew that that mechanic was just going to be unique to that set alone right um and it probably wasn't going to get out, out of hand or it's a lot easier for them to test and control um but i do think that uh I mean, I think we've said it uh, already a couple of times, but it's just, it's really interesting when you can get decks that it's not like uh, white. It, uh, what was Astral Side usually played in? Because it's white and what? White green. White green. Mm -hmm. So it's not like white green wasn't already an archetype that sort of existed that had these colors that are doing their own things, right? But with that particular card and other cards available in the current rotation, it sounds like the deck played a lot different than how other white-green decks played. Oh, yeah. And I think that that's what's really interesting because that's kind of something that I feel like I'm missing a little bit right now when I'm playing some, like, standard or I'm playing some draft or even in commander in particular is, like, I feel like I'm I'm missing some of that unique uh, 
touch to different deck archetypes where a lot of these decks sort of feel very much like oh okay this is just like a red black deck this is just like green black or i'm playing a lot of black but <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's hard to not deliver on player expectation right where the the point in time where astral slide came into being was a unique time in magic's history in terms of standard being the perfect the premier format uh and w they were in a mode of experimentation right yeah. where they knew that like well if we took these big risks these decks are going to rotate out right like you said it's not a permanent uh eternal game state right it's not right. A, an eternal a, eternal format so we can kind of take these bigger risks we can see kind of what play patterns can emerge here we can develop interesting and unique play patterns and figure out uh what resonates with players and i think now we've kind of entered this era where uh, quite a bit of that is being recycled, right? We're we're getting kind of like, okay, well, this is control, this is aggro, this is mid range, yeah. But I feel like we are not seeing these sort of really unique styles of of play emerge anymore, right? And part of that is because um, they're hard to account for, right? Magic yeah. is producing a lot more sets, and they don't have as much time to test as we saw with Nadu. Uh, <laughs> Shots fired. I Shots get it. fired. Uh, but you know they were were they're not able to make sure that these uh, archetypes and things are functional. Uh, and I do wonder how much of this is uh, that if they do have one of these that takes off and it is very good, how like what are sort of your vectors of attack at that point, right? Like Astral Slide was this breakout deck that performed very well in standard. It had a moment of time and extended, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, but then that was kind of about it, right? Once it rotated out, uh, we haven't really seen this archetype or this deck emerge in Legacy. We haven't seen it show up in Modern. Right, there's uh, like flicker it, decks now. Can like... it really be played in Modern? Because it's, it, 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 it's sort of this pre-Modern, right? There's that pre-Modern format, it, you know, because Onslaught's right before the cutoff for Modern. Yeah. So it kind of is in this weird era that doesn't really have a home anymore so right it, it seems like they're leaning a little bit more into white flickering decks um sure currently but not on that same uh same level well and there was a there was a green white flicker deck that came out um i don't know maybe five years after astral slide that you played restoration angel and thrag tusk uh and it was restoration angel flickers a creature when she comes into play sure uh and that deck was it had kind of a similar play pattern but mm. nothing quite like astral slide mm. <laughs> every enabler nowadays is just like you play this and you gain life and draw a card and it's like well that's not really cool. an enabler. let's play a land draw a card nah do <laughs> flubs he he's kind of cool though i kind of like i kind of like flubs Hey, at least he's making a unique play pattern, right? Is he? Yeah. Okay. He is. I guess so. Yeah. You're playing Hellbent. You've got no cards in hand. You're just top of the head. Sorry, did you just say he's making a unique play pattern and then used an existing play pattern as an example? <laughs> did I? He said he's playing Hellbent. Oh, no, that's not. Okay. That's not. That's just a term that means you don't have any cards in hand. Well, no, okay. Yeah, that's just... It doesn't play like Hellbent, but you're no, essentially... I'm just saying you're Hellbent. You okay. don't have any cards in hand. Technically, you're not. You have one card in hand. 